will speak to you. He is a professor at Cornell University, director of the Cornell International Workplace Studies Program, and internationally recognized for his work on innovative workplace strategies, but he's best known to me as my thesis advisor, who I've known for many, many, many years. Indeed. Welcome. <laughs> Actually, that's a great uh, segue into what I wanted to start with, which is I'm uh, pleased to be here, but even more so because it gives me the opportunity to experience one of the real great pleasures of being an academic mission, and that is to see your former students uh, excel in the world. And just for my pleasure, if no one else's, could those people who've been my student or from Cornell just raise your hand here? Because that, that's a lot of people. And these people are leaders in their field now. And again, to all of you, I couldn't be more proud of uh, what you've accomplished. And part of the reason for asking them to raise their hands is that if you're at all interested in anything I say, they would be good people to talk to. <laughs> They're carrying on the flag. I'm going to uh, talk this morning uh, in uh, a way that may surprise you a little bit. I have the green buttons. The green buttons. It's too big. Ah, thank you. I'm going to talk to you a little bit um, from the perspective of a barbarian. Um, why barbarian? Uh, this conference is called Work Tech. Uh, I'm not going to talk about technology at all. Uh, I am going to talk about the workplace. But I'm going to come at it from, I think, a rather different perspective than you've heard this morning. And that is, first of all, again, I'm going to talk about how people use the workplace. But you're going to see that I'm going to talk about it drawing on some of my recent work, uh, which has been in healthcare and health design, not the work that we did for over 20 years, exploring many of the questions that have already been talked about this morning. I started the International Workplace Studies Program in 1989, uh, and several of the people here have been sponsors and collaborators in that research as well, and it's a pleasure to see them. But I'm also going to talk to you from a research perspective. A lot of what I think you've heard today, by and large, is about intentions. It's about what you hope will happen when you build things, design things, create the workplaces that you've been reading about, when you employ the new technologies that you've been hearing about. A lot of that is about intentions. And this is just a building that I worked with in Melbourne, uh, it's uh, the National Australian Bank building, which incorporated lots of the kinds of things that uh, we've studied and talked about for years and which we've been talking about today. Very interesting. What I would say is that by and large, this organization, and along with many organizations that I work with, when it comes down to the final analysis, they're not very interested in understanding how it works. And that's for in many cases a simple reason, which is I just spent $100 million or $125 million. Do well, I want some guy from Cornell University to come in and do an independent study and find out that even 10% of it didn't work the way I thought it did, or 30%? Because most of the time, what people are doing in these organizations, in fact, is either they believe it works, they hope it works, or they proclaim it works. <laughs> what I'm going to argue with you this morning is that we need to have a stronger research basis for all the kinds of things that you want to do. I've heard many interesting things this morning about new technologies, where they're going, what they're going to do. But I'm going to draw on some of my healthcare work to suggest several different kinds of research approach to improving performance and doing even transformational change. And again, what I would say is that if you look at the things that have been talked about today, we've heard collaboration again and again, innovation, attraction, retention, brand, health even, productivity, uh, that's what people hope these environments will do. This is what they typically measure, is cost, whether it's energy, whether it's efficiency, whether it's utilization rates. But in fact, if you think about it, the fact that you might have uh, a utilization rate that's gone down or gone up, if you will, 20% uh, or 30% or you saved $88 million, that is good. And it makes a big difference to the real estate and the property side of it. But if you did that, you could also show that your product, new product invention didn't catch on, didn't work. What difference does it make? Is that the fact of the matter is that the first need is to understand whether the primary mission has been accomplished or not. I'm going to talk about that. So why have I focused on healthcare? Um, 
for a couple of reasons. One is that, as you can see, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars are being spent on new healthcare facilities in this country and across the world. Uh, basically, new hospital costs about one billion dollars uh, to construct today. Um, and what interested me in this and why I shifted in some ways from my work in the corporate workplace was that in this world, getting it wrong has dire consequences. If you get it wrong and you not only have fear, you have anxiety, you have pain, you have infection, and in the worst cases, you have death. Getting it right really matters. And one of the reasons that I think hospitals are so interesting is that they understand it so that there is an evidence-driven model there where you can't say, I hope it works, I believe it works, or I'll tell you that it works. There's too much at stake. And I would argue that that model should come back, if you will, to the corporate workplace as well. So hospitals are changing. They're all about patient-centered care. You wouldn't know necessarily by looking just at the picture, whether it's a hospital or a hotel. Um, and people are trying to make changes in how these are done in a way that will, again, improve the quality of care and quality of patient experience. But also, clearly, the hospital is one of the most complex and difficult and expensive workplaces to build that we can imagine. And so it's also critical from the point of view of the things you're talking about, attraction and retention of staff, doctors, nurses, and others, for competitiveness, because it's a business, not just a healthcare organization. How do you know what works? We talked and heard a little bit about different kinds of uh, evidence that's been uh, talked about today. The term that's used, and many of you know it, in particularly the healthcare field, is evidence-based design. Just the process, essentially, to use the best available research to try to make decisions. Fundamentally. I'd like to distinguish between two kinds of research today. And that is what I call academic-based research, which I, as an academic, have practiced for decades. And the goal there is rigor. That is, to try to provide the highest quality, credible data to help make decisions and justify decisions. Note that you're going in the right direction. It typically takes a long time. If I do an academic study, it's going to take anywhere from one to two years easily to do that kind of academic study. You'll see when we talk about what I call project-based research, that if you're working on a project, you're not going to wait two years to have Frank Becker come in and do a study. You need to have information. So we're going to come back to the alternative or another way of thinking about this. So academic research. I just want to give you one example. This is from my own recent research. Um, and it's interesting, again, that we talked a lot this morning about virtual work, mobile work, remote work, all the technology. What are the two most famous campuses being built today? Apple. Apple and Facebook. You wouldn't call them sort of laggards in the technology field. Um, and yet they are building campuses. So again, the issue of going back and testing. Do we really know what's going on? Do we really know why we're doing it? Do the benefits that we think are going to occur really occur? Let me just give you very quickly, I'm not going to talk too much about the detail, but this is a recent project, a hospital in New Jersey. They built a new wing. The wing itself cost $300 million. Uh, and part of what it was designed to do was improve communication between doctors and nurses, collaboration, but also patient satisfaction, so employee satisfaction, uh, and also to uh, create a higher quality environment. I just want to give you a sense of when you talk about academic research, it's complicated, and that's one of the reasons it takes a long time. Just, I'm not going to go through, but we collected seven kinds of data. And that data was not just what we've heard about a lot, surveys. I will tell you that surveys are great for some things. They're actually terrible for learning how people actually behave. Um, so we didn't do that. We actually had people who spent hundreds of hours observing people and recording it in great detail, and especially program PDA. So we don't have to guess about activity patterns. We know what the activity patterns are. We didn't guess about healthcare outcomes. You think your patients are getting better? That doesn't work. Let's look at the institutional data on medical outcomes. Look at the institutional data on organizational outcomes. If these units that we're building are meant to improve the work environment for nurses, and we know the average age of a nurse is 48, fatigue is a big issue. Are they walking more or less? 
I can ask you how far you walk. I wouldn't trust it for a minute. But if we put pedometers on you and we track you, we then have real data. So the point of this is that we use all these. We do use surveys, but we use them in conjunction with other things in this academic research. And we generate lots of kinds of real data. Again, the data on the left is activity data and so on. We have the medical data. We have nurse satisfaction data. We have lots of data. What's interesting about this and important is that when we went through all this, the patient satisfaction increased dramatically. However, in terms of medical outcomes, in terms of organizational outcomes, in terms of nurse morale satisfaction and so on, there were no improvements whatsoever after $300 million. That's worth knowing. Um, and what I want to, the reason I'm showing you this about the communication is that there were a whole set of assumptions that were driving this that made sense. They weren't crazy. And they were driven in some sense by what available research there was there. It was all about creating, again, the right kind of environment for communication and collaboration between doctors and nurses. You can see it's very well used by the doctors from approximately 9 to 11 a.m. on the days when they do rounds. And when they come into that space, it's great. All the nurses leave. <laughs> they actually go to all these other spaces when the doctors leave and the nurses come back. Um, so the problem was, and they use all kinds of new technology, voice Sarah and other kinds of things to communicate, the problem was that no one actually looked at the social system of the medical personnel and the social hierarchy and structure of that and how that influenced how people use space. So one of the points I'd like to make in this kind of academic research and others is the importance of understanding things from a systems perspective. It's not just about design. It's not just about technology. It's not just about the work process. It's not just about the demographics. It's how all those interact together to create an outcome. And if you try to make interventions based on a single factor, the likelihood of being able to produce the results in a predictable fashion that you want is very low. So I want to talk a little bit quickly about practice-based research. This is an alternative. What do I mean by this? It's simply, rather than academic research, very rigorous, takes a long time, gets you credible results. But there's some, a few things that it doesn't do. I've already mentioned one, it doesn't help you with a specific project in its own time frame. It also doesn't get project specific data. I want to know about my organization right now. I don't want to know that they did something in the Wild Cornell Medical College to study when in fact I'm working in Minnesota. <laughs> we always think we're different in Minnesota than some. So practice-based research is not about having the most scientific, credible data, where the goal for the researcher is often publication in a peer-reviewed journal. It's insight into what some of you have talked about already today. It's about engagement, and I'll come back to this. The notion that this approach to research has a potential for engaging employees in a way that leads to not only different motivation, but different kinds of interventions that are more likely to work and be accepted. And I want to give you just one example of a practice-based research project. This is at our local community hospital in Ithaca, New York. It was done by uh, Dr. David Papa, who's also worked with me and my students. This is his project. This was not my project. Um, but it's a great example of the fact that no matter how much you plan and who you involve with planning and how much data you collect, you're never going to get it perfect. You're just not. And this is a particularly dramatic example, I think. This is we about a neonatologist takes care of sick babies. Um, and this is the layout uh, of the hospital as it existed, where you come in uh, to uh, the delivery room. If there's a problem with that baby, you have to travel that number. It's almost 300 yards to get to an operation. So there's a lot of serious issues. And the point I'd like to make is this is actually a very good hospital. It has a very good reputation. The scores that it, are institutionally required, it does very well. And of course, the doctors and the nurses and other staff that are really committed. Um, this is not about people who don't care. But what I want to tell you is basically for four critical conditions when a baby's born, that there's basically 30 minutes from the time you identify the problem at birth to the time you make the decision to save that baby's life. You have 30 minutes before brain damage sets in and that baby has the potential to die. Okay, so this is really serious. We don't guess about how things are. So what this doctor did, he took the time and energy, and he started to look at using the kind of 
Toyota production systems lean process methodology of not asking people how are you doing it, what are you doing it, but looking in great detail at every step of the process. He started to look at what was going on. I'm just going to give you a couple examples of what he found. He first did this kind of analysis that you've probably heard about or seen fishbone diagrams are not unusual. But he identified there was problems with people, problems with communication, problems with equipment, procedures, and even the design was part of the equipment. And I can't take you through all these, but I'm just going to give you a couple examples. My point being here that some of the smallest things can have cumulatively a large impact, but you don't get at them by just guessing. You get at them by looking and using some of the same methods from the academic model, but using them in a different time frame with a different kind of approach. So just a couple of the problems he identified. Uh, one was that uh, you need to get into locked cabinets to be able to get the medical uh, equipment and, and medicine you need. The problem was that uh, there was a lock and key access. And so the clock is ticking to detect who's got the key. Where's the key? Anybody know where the key is? Tick, 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 tick. So again, what did he do? Let's use a swipe card access. Let's put the card on a lanyard around your neck. And we don't have to look for the key. We just, when it happens, you go like this. We get the medicine and we type it at the time. My point is these very simple things, and I'll just give you one other one, which is unbelievable, is that there was a phone. And when you're in the delivery room and you know there's a problem, you call the operating room to get them going. There was only one problem, is that that one phone was used for a variety of purposes. So I call, and I get this. It's a busy signal. Call back. You know, it took him quite a bit of time and energy to get a dedicated phone line. My point again being that very, very simple things that are having a major impact, and in this case, we pay attention because the consequences are so dire. But if we believe the physical environment in the corporate workplace is important, why aren't we looking as well? What is he able to do? He went from the goal being 30 minutes, their time was almost 39 minutes, and he took it down with a variety of things, more than just 18 minutes. He took down, he saved babies' lives, right? He saved brain damage. And he did it by adopting methods that could be used and are used in an academic research process, but he did it in a time frame that took not two years or one year, but took more like five months, and did it basically himself on his own time. Okay, now, in the remaining time, I want to also talk about another kind of evidence. We talk about academic research, we talk about practice-based research, now I want to talk about research for transformation, which is still another way of using evidence. And this is one of my favorite examples of what not to do. Um, this, is, uh, this is not innovation, this is novelty. This is someone, an architect in this case, who thought round makes young people, babies, and mothers in particular, in the maternal ward, feel more natural. <laughs> <laughs> the turnover rate went up 25% after they initiated this building because the collaboration and communication among the nurses was so affected by the way in which the corridors were. I want to just give a couple examples from our earlier work in the corporate world in which these are real innovations that were done, and we looked at them, some of you, these, these are all reports are available on our website, IWSP, which is the International Workplace Studies Program. But this is, again, a bank, I, I, I can't take you through all the detail, but a bank in the Netherlands where they had to get up, an, essentially, a new corporate headquarters quickly. They had to be able to take it completely down and eliminate it if the government wanted them to at some point because the government owned the land. And the point of it is here is that we were doing research which I don't see a lot of in other contexts, where we're looking not only at the cost issues, the construction cost, uh, the time of construction, but we're also looking at how the employees use the space and how they felt about it. Because I can make it go faster, I can make it go cheaper, and if nobody wants to work there, this is the space that's going to work. Um, this is another example. Uh, this was Monsanto, a chemical uh, pharmaceutical company, Monsanto State in uh, St. Louis. They needed to get up space quickly. Who would have thought that a tent would work? Uh, they tried it, uh, and again, they found that it worked on a variety of levels, cost, time, and in fact, the research scientists liked it better than the conventional high-quality buildings because of the ability to interact, the scale of it, uh, that it was a more interesting, innovative environment. And just this last one, again, uh, in Germany, uh, uh, 
uh, a manufacturing facility for custom-made connectors uh, in which they have the R&D unit, the warehouse unit, uh, and this is your transportation mode. Every single employee has an electric scooter, uh, and you get around in this thing by an electric scooter. But what I like about this, and what I come back to, is that this works on a flexibility basis, this works on a cost basis, but it also works on a employee attraction and retention basis because they brought any new prospective engineer had to come here and work here for a day to see what they would like about doing this because they could be a very good engineer and a very poor fit for this way of working. So they've used it, that way. they bring customers, say you want to look at innovation, we'll show you innovation. Okay, what characterizes all of these kinds of projects that I'm showing you is that there's a mindset behind them. A mindset is a way of thinking about things, very simply. And that then what we've been talking about is developing a toolkit, which is a range of techniques that you can use to analyze, collect, and interpret evidence. So you don't guess, so you know. And the goal is what I'm calling synergetic design. And I'm going to give you two examples from my hospital work uh, about what I mean about this. Succeeding on multiple levels simultaneously. The first is a project um, that one of my graduate students did, a Singaporean student did in Singapore with one of the very interesting hospital. The focus of it really was on a sustainable design, and he did a kind of academic study about the impact of energy and cost and so on. But the part that I'd like to focus on in our short time today is um, this. They asked me if I'd like to go see the roof garden. And I said, not really. I said, I've seen a lot of roof gardens. I know what grass looks like. I don't need to do this. And they said, no, come on. Let's, let's go. Look. Okay, fine. So we went up to the roof garden. And when I realized they it was the wrong word, it was a roof farm. Not unlike what uh, I think Phil was talking about earlier. And that is, they're growing food. But what's interesting about the number of levels in which this works. So one thing someone might say, who's going to maintain this? Who's going to take care of it? So the CEO knew that in Singapore, people were desperate to have these kind of opportunities. They live in highly dense urban environments and couldn't do it. So we invited in the surrounding neighbors who are often very unhappy with the new hospital, creates noise, <coughs> traffic, and so on. They asked them if they'd like to garden here and maintain their neighborhood love doing that. Is that, uh, what do they do with the food? They pick the food and they use it in special events in the hospital. All about healthy food. The CEO had a broader vision is that Singapore is almost completely food dependent. But his thought was, why don't we change the way in which Singapore operates? What happens if every roof in, in Singapore had a garden and could grow food? We could try to reduce our food dependency and we could improve the quality of food. So his vision was all about the community. And in fact, what it really is, is he's, his notion, just like what I'm going to show you in a minute, is all about the idea that we are focusing too much on sickness, even in hospitals, we ought to be focusing on health, we ought to be focusing on uh, involving the community in meaningful ways. And we ought to be involving our staff in different ways as well. So philanthropy takes a different kind of role here. Here, you are the proud supporter of the banana plant. You're the proud supporter of the tomato plant, the lettuce plants, or whatever else. And those employees come up and check out their space, their plants, and they feel committed, and they talk about it. And so the goal is much broader than just Again, reducing energy because you had a green view. It's working on multiple levels. I want to finish with this project, which is much closer to home. It's in Detroit. It's part of the Henry Ford uh, healthcare system. It's the Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital. Very, very similar vision. But here I want to talk a little bit also about the research that this and the evidence that this CEO did. The CEO here, if you can imagine, brand new hospital, was a former executive of the Ritz Carlton had no healthcare experience whatsoever. He came in here to build and design a new hospital because of his customer focus. And one of the first things he said was, I don't really know anything about my customers. Large Iranian expat population, large African American population, large Jewish population, he says, I don't know anything about these people. What should we do, he asked the staff. And they said, why don't we run some focus groups? And he said, I don't think so. <laughs> he said, I don't think we'll learn anything. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to invite myself to dinner to everybody in the to, to people in the neighborhood. I'm going to call them up and say, I'd like to make dinner and come to your house, and uh, we'll break bread and we'll talk. What do you think about that? People go, oh my God, they're talking about that. Sure, come along. 
He said, how many people would be there? He said, they said, well, there's four people, or five, or six, or seven. Get there to be 30. <laughs> Why? They told every neighbor, every relative, every friend that the CEO was coming. He came in, and he learned what these people really cared about, and what was their interest, and how they really lived in a way he would never have gotten from folks. So this is not publishable academic data. It's not systematic in the same way that uh, the practice-based research is. But in fact, what he's done with this is create an environment which, again, it's all about health. And so, again, farmers markets inside the uh, facility itself, and even more to the case about the community involvement and connection, he's built greenhouses to grow fresh food and vegetables. He buses in school bus full of children to come learn about healthy food and healthy eating. He then takes those children on that visit to a test kitchen which he's built where they cook and prepare the food that they've seen growing in that. And then he runs programs with their parents so they can take it on home and learn how to do it. Okay. So it's working on what I would call the synergetic level. It's working not only in a triple bottom line of finance and uh, space and design and the environment, but it's also working on a people level on multiple levels. What does it do? I'm saying that if you want to really find innovations that work, we need to drive them by that evidence. That evidence takes different forms. And it's evidence plus experience that stimulates the imagination. It's not like that architect who just thought this is a cool idea. And from my point of view, as an academic researcher, what I'm doing now with my current crop of students is introducing them to a variety of ways of dealing with that uh, practice-based research which we're taking to hospitals be able to have a serious basis for moving forward with new ways. Thanks very much.